Hello everyone, a very good morning to those who are joining us from Singapore and Asia and good afternoon or good evening to all of you joining us from other parts of the world. Thank you for being here with us for today's online event on innovations in quantum information technology presented by SG Innovate and the Japan Science and Technology Agency. My name is Jin from SG Innovate and as a Singapore government-backed investor, we have been building up and driving deep tech innovations in AI, healthcare, quantum tech, and autonomous technologies across various industries. At SG Innovate, we believe Singapore has the resources and capabilities to tackle hard problems that matter to people around the world. And SG Innovate has been established to help ambitious and capable people to build technology-intensive products born out of science research. Today, we have the first part of a two-part series where expert speakers in quantum information technologies will introduce their cutting-edge research. We encourage you to engage with our presenters during the session by submitting your questions in the Q&A box located on the lower panel of your screen. Without further ado, I would like to invite Emmy from JST to start us off. Emmy, please. Thank you, Jin, for your kind introduction. And thank you, everyone, for attending today's seminar. I'm Emmy Kaneko, Director of Singapore Office of Japan Science and Technology Agency, or JST in short. JST is an innovative, uh, mission-oriented funding agency, driving high-risk research that generates real value for global society. We have a research program called Precursory Research for Embryonic uh, Science and Technology, or PRESTO, which is devoted to supporting junior researchers in Japan. The two speakers for, day, uh, for today from Japan, Dr. Sugiyama and Dr. Matsuzaki, are supported by this program in the research area of quantum software. For today, we also invited Dr. Uh, Malgu from uh, the Center of Quantum Technologies, or CQT, because it seems, uh, it seems that this center does the research in quantum technologies with the highest standards in Singapore so that Dr. Mao would make a good match with the Japanese uh, speakers. When we say quantum, you may think of hardware such as quantum computer, but today's talks are focused on more innovative information processing method, which can create a technological foundation for real realizing the com quantum computing deployable in the society. So without further ado, let me introduce our first speaker, Dr. Takanori Sugiyama. He is a project research uh, associate at the University of Tokyo and a pressed researcher at JST. In 2013, he obtained his Doctor of Science from the University of Tokyo in the field of uh, quantum information theory. After his post at uh, ETH Zurich and Osaka University, he joined an experimental group at the University of Tokyo in 2017, which focused on superconducting quantum computers, and last year he joined JST. His talk title for today is Stati Statistical Method for Accelerating the Development of a Quantum Computer. Dr. Sugiyama, please. Hello. Um, Hello. Hello. Hi, yeah, I'm Takanori you. speaking. Oh, okay. Um, okay, then I share my presentations. Um, so I tried to share my slides. Oh, can you see my slides? Yes. Okay. So thank you, Amy, for our introduction. I'm Takanori Sugiyama from the University of Tokyo. So today, I will talk about my project in, supported by the JST. So let me introduce myself uh, again. So my background is uh, theoretical physics. And uh, after the graduation, uh, I moved to the ETH Zurich in the Switzerland. And uh, this is my first postdoc. And after that, I moved to Osaka University and I belong to a statistical group. So uh, here I uh, run and I get in touch with uh, statistics. And after that, I moved to my current affiliation at the University of Tokyo, and currently I belong to an experimental group on quantum uh, computer. And my research subject is quantum information theory, especially uh, characterization of quantum operations. And uh, it's an interdisciplinary field of physics, statistics, and computation. So my subject is 
around here. So uh, as I said, uh, I currently I'm in an experimental group. So this is uh, an superconducting qubit integration team in the University of Tokyo. So uh, I in charge with the characterization part here and that's the other theorist. So this is the outline of today's talk. So first I briefly explain basic concepts in quantum computer and then I explain uh, characterization element of quantum operations. So this is the topic of this uh, talk and project. And third, uh, I talk about my first project and uh, finally I summarize this talk. So what is a quantum computer? It's a device for performing quantum, uh, computational algorithms with uh, quantumness. So this is a basic uh, conceptual uh, picture of user computer, the yellow part, and quantum computer, a green part. So the user computer consists of control, memory, and operations. So we connect input device and output device to this computer. Uh, and in quantum computer, we add this quantum uh, operation unit. Uh, so there are many computational models for performing quantum uh, operation here. But uh, so this talk, uh, we focus on quantum circuit model. In the circuit model, a uh, computation is performed by um, this uh, sequential uh, quantum, uh, elemental quantum operations, the initialization, many quantum gate and uh, measurement. And after the measurement, we obtain measurement outcomes and we perform uh, classical uh, or standard data processing on the data then we obtain the computational results. This is a procedure of the quantum computation in the circuit model. And the advantage of this uh, quantum computer is it has high po uh, computational power. But the challenge is uh, this uh, quantum part is very sensitive to, highly sensitive to uh, environmental noises. So the outcome, uh, the, to overcome such sen high sensitivity to noises is a very ch big challenge. Also, there are many physical platforms for realizing this quantum operational unit. For example, a superconducting quantum circuit. Uh, my group is working on this uh, part, uh, or to trapped ion semiconductor quantum dots or optical integration circuits. These are famous platforms, uh, physical platforms for quantum computer. And next, let me explain uh, path towards industry, uh, path of quantum computer towards industry. The horizontal axis is the number of physical qubits. So roughly speaking, this is the size of the quantum computer. So uh, larger is better. Then the vertical axis is the error rate of elemental quantum operations. So, so smaller is better because smaller means the error rate of small, smaller. That means more accurate, so smaller is better. And in the superconducting uh, circuit platform, uh, the current uh, uh, position is around here. And numerical and theoretical research revealed that and or uh, investigates, it invest investigation uh, indicates that uh, for large scale con uh, computation for industry, uh, we have to achieve up to this green region then there are big gap between these two parts. Uh, about size, it's about one, two, three, four, four to five digits. And so for accuracy, it's about one to two as the digit improvement are necessary. And this talk is about this uh, two digit, sorry, a two digit improvement of accuracy. So in experiments, the procedure for accuracy, this accuracy improvement is as follows. So first step one, uh, experimenters evaluate uh, what kind of error occurs in their device. Then here accuracy evaluation or characterization of elemental computer operations. So this kind of methods are used. And the second step is uh, they try to uh, improve the, uh, uh, these operations by, by the, from the result of this characterization. In this process, they perform calibration of control systems or identification of noise sources. And these are topic of this talk and the project. Then uh, towards uh, accuracy improvement, so uh, the elemental quantum operations uh, uh, categorized into four uh, parts. The first one is state initializations, the second one is measurement, 
and third one is one qubit gauge, and fourth one is two qubit gauge. And in experiments, as, uh, as shown in before, experimenters do uh, some specific experiments for characterization to obtain data. And from this one, uh, they try to uh, figure out well, where is wrong, then, then try to improve, or they uh, perform some calibration process. Then this experiment and this data processing are called characterization. And this part is called noise source identification. And this part is called calibration. And this calibration, uh, sorry, uh, characterization is related to statistical methods because in quantum mechanics, the measurements are given probabilistically. It's a, it's a principle of nature. Then the result, uh, this data obtained uh, contains statistical fluctuations, then we need um, appropriate statistical uh, data processing method. So this, so, uh, this is why I'm working on this statistical method. And, uh, let me briefly compare a uh, current known characterization method. Our uh, first one is a randomized benchmarking. It's a um, default standard method and it is used in almost all experiment on quantum computer. And the second one is the gas tomography, GST. Um, it's, um, so there are two categories. The first one is a randomized benchmarking type and the other one is a tomography type. And GST is the current standard in uh, tomography type and RSGQT is uh, my uh, developed, uh, past developed method. And so this is a graph for performances required for the double-jet improvement, uh, I believe. So there are six uh, uh, performances, the figures of merit, reliability or the uh, easiness of data processing experiment, or some variety of operations to be applied and amount of errors information. And this black line is the performance required for the double-jet improvement. And so this yellow line is the performances of randomized benchmarking. And this uh, blue one and uh, purple one are performances of GST and RSGQT. So as uh, you can see easily, so for partial performances, uh, the no method has sufficient or enough performances. But um, so all these have these uh, uh, disadvantages, lack of performances. So, so my purpose of my, this project is to achieve uh, or to develop new method with this green uh, performances. And it means the method with balanced high performances. So this is the first object. Uh, the goal is to uh, develop a characterization method and a character with this kind of uh, performances and after that develop new calibration method and identification method based on the characterization method. And uh, these methods should be should not be specified for a specific physical systems. And the second one is the implementation of the software for using this method. So I think uh, so methods with this uh, high performance, balanced high performance is a really complicated system, it's hard to implement it by uh, individual experimental groups. So I think uh, this software uh, is very helpful for accelerating the development of quantum computer. And my approach is quantum tomography. And especially um, I work on the proof of theoretical reliability by mathematical statistics. And second, uh, I work on proof of numerical reliability and numerical e easiness by, uh, by numerical experiment. And thirdly, I work on proof of easiness of experiment and usefulness of this method for accuracy improvement by real physical experiments. So this is related to my career. So my background physics, and I belong to a, a group of statistics. In the country, I'm working on uh, experimental group to achieve these things. And goal of the project is uh, the first one is the establishment of methods for one and two qubit systems. So this is a necessary conditions. The second goal is establishing the methods for leakage errors because um, so roughly in the theoretically uh, quantum bit it um, 
basic component of quantum computer considered as a two-level system, but um, it's uh, not a uh, actually, it's not a two-level system. It has higher levels, and the effect of such higher level is very uh, is not negligible. Uh, such levels is done in recent experiments, so uh, this is also important. And third one is um, uh, for crosstalk errors. The crosstalk error means that uh, if we want to perform single qubit errors, but uh, the effect uh, it affects on the other parts. So uh, this um, this kind of error is called crosstalk, and recent experiments report that this crosstalk is still ex exists. So this uh, method for leakage and crosstalk are very important. And my current status is as follows. So uh, first, um, I developed a new method for gate operations, uh, gate operations, uh, one qubit gate and two qubit gate. And the performance is uh, with uh, this red line. So about the uh, easiness of this processing or easiness of experiments or this amount of errors or variety of operations, uh, it uh, has sufficient uh, performances, but about the reliability, uh, it's not sufficient. So we need a uh, better method, still we need a uh, better method. So I'm working on improvement of uh, these lack of reliabilities. Now second, uh, I'm developing a method for the state initialization and measurement and hopefully, if I, in the country, I have an idea, and by combining this one, uh, uh, I hope that uh, we can improve these uh, lack of reliabilities. And finally, I am developing a library for using the developed method with uh, two uh, software engineers. And so currently, I am working on, uh, we are working on implementation of known method, and in, future, in the future, uh, we will add the developed method. And finally, let me explain our future perspective. So the first uh, project is a 3.5 years, oh, I'm sorry, years uh, project, and currently we are on here. And after that, uh, we to, uh, if we obtain uh, this kind of uh, balanced performance method and with uh, user-friendly software, then if it is useful, then it will be used by developers in several physical platforms. And then oh, we uh, hope that we can contribute to further accuracy improvement for quantum information processing or quantum technologies. For example, realization of quantum error correction or realization of quantum information protocols based on quantum circuit model, like uh, quantum sensing or quantum communications. Especially I, I'm uh, focusing uh, the most important is uh, realization of quantum error correction, but uh, the other quantum information process uh, protocols are so possible candidates of the contribution. And the second one is the maintenance for keeping quantum computers' performance because uh, this characterization or calibration methods are used in control calibration at periodic maintenance at uh, quantum, of quantum computer. So even if we obtain high performance quantum computer, we need uh, uh, such periodic maintenance. And the third one is a more academic one um, because our method is um, is applicable to free body quantum systems. Then uh, we can contribute to the first detailed analysis of such uh, interesting free body quantum uh, systems. So let me add this little summary. So we explain the basic concept of quantum computer, and especially we we explain the accuracy improvement and characterization of uh, fundamental quantum operations. And uh, we explained our, our project and approach and our project and current status. So that's all. Thank you very much. Uh, OK, thank you, Dr. Takanori, for your very informative uh, presentation. Uh, while I wait for others to write their questions in the Q&A box, uh, let me ask a very general question to you. Uh, Yes. Uh, tell us uh, if there's any international collaboration you're engaged in for your research. Uh, for my project, uh, currently it's not. Mm -hmm. So it's oh. very uh, domestic. Just in uh, with the collaboration with my experiment experimentalists in, in our group. Um, for some, so we are just in.
just uh, within uh, this group. Are you looking for any international collaborators from Singapore, US, UK? Sure, uh, of course, uh, because if we, if I have uh, good methods, then I, it's, it's my pleasure to contribute to the use in the other platform or other by other groups. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very so, much. Uh, yeah, thank you. Okay. So it seems that we have a question from Peter Morrison. The, she says, very thank interesting. You. The status chart shows that your method falls short of theoretical real reliability, but request and request both uh, perform well on the metric. Why not use those methods along with Presto? Did you get the question? You can read it in the Q and A box. Q and A box, so pretty yes. nice. So at uh, first, I moved to the slide related to, to the questions. Uh -huh. and the status chart shows that your method falls short in the risical reliability, but RSQT uh, and GST both perform well on the metric. Why not use this method along with uh, press OK? I get it. So the reason is uh, their uh, hardness or, uh, or their high cost for uh, data processing and experiment. Um, let me show the, right. Um, so they have a theoretical, a theoretically, the real, oh, sorry. So theoretically, uh, they have high reliability, but for numerical reliability, that uh, means uh, the, the, the reliability in practice and the cost of uh, data processing experiment, uh, the performance is uh, very cheap, then uh, it's not sufficient for performing uh, double digit improvements. So that's the reason uh, why we didn't choose this uh, GST or RSGQT. Uh, is this an uh, appropriate answer? Yeah, I guess. Uh, I guess yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the next question is from Paul Griffin. You can read thank it you. in the uh, Q&A box. Have you characterized oh, yeah. current available quantum computers, uh, e.g. IBM Q or Rigetti? Uh, not yet. So I'm just uh, combined my, result, uh, my method with uh, the device in our group. So I haven't applied to it to IBM Q or Rigetti the, uh, their devices. Uh, one reason is that um, I considered the, the approach, but um, at least IBM uh, requires uh, some, um, let's say, cont contour contract to perform such things because uh, my method is very related uh, to their performance and accuracy, so deep uh, re re regions of their uh, device, then I have to uh, uh, make a contour, uh, con contours. Yeah, then so, but uh, in future, if possible, I, I want to perform, uh, I want to use my method, combine my method with these devices. Okay, thank you. The next question is from Janno. Uh, he, says, he says, how far away are we from having a commercialized quantum computer in which mm -hmm. every household has a quantum computer? Um, so how far it's uh, first, uh, it's related to this slide, I think. So currently we are around here and so for industry, so they're big. So uh, how far? So it's very far. So five <laughs> at least four to five digit improvement of size and two one to two digit improvement of accuracy are required. So there so there are, must be big many breakthroughs for uh, connecting these uh, areas. I think, and I think uh, even at this region uh, we cannot have. Um, household quantum computer. Uh, I'm or 
I think most uh, researchers are imagining that we have a quantum computer server, like uh, current uh, supercomputer server, that we connect uh, from house or, or some company uh, with usual uh, computer by some network to such a uh, quantum computer server. And just we through the information of uh, computa uh, information uh, computational program to the server, then the quantum computer uh, or perform the computation in the server. Then after that, uh, the compute quantum computer uh, return back the computational results to us. So that's how um, I imagine. So even at this uh, uh, region, uh, so I don't think uh, we can have some household quantum computer. Okay. So that's my answer. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I have we have two more questions from the audience, but because of the time constraint, we have to move on to the next speaker. But uh, you please type your replies in the uh, Q and A box. Okay, you, you can type your replies. Okay, to the, to yeah, the I questions in the Q and A box. Thank you very much, okay. Dr. Takanui. Okay, okay thank then, you very much. Thank you. Okay, then uh, now it's time for us to welcome Dr. Yuichiro Matsuzaki. He received his PhD from the University of Oxford for his research about the theoretical aspect of measurement-based quantum technology in 2011. Subsequently, he started working at NTT Basic Research Laboratories as part of a supercomputing uh, cubic group. From last year onwards, he joined the National Institute of Advanced Industrial Science and Technology to work on computer, uh, quantum computation and quantum unleading. His presentation title for today is a Direct Estimation of the Energy Gap Between the Ground State and Excited State with uh, Quantum Unleading. Dr. Matsuzaki, please go ahead. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, do you hear me also? Can you see my slide? Yes, yes. Uh, okay, enough. perfect. Okay, so um, let so thank you for giving me an opportunity to talk here. So it's my great pleasure. So let me introduce myself a little bit. So I got a PhD degree at Oxford University. Um, the topic is quantum information theory. And after that, I moved to NTT Basic Research Laboratories. I worked with superconducting qubit uh, experimentalists. Also, two, from 2090, I moved to AIST. So currently, I am working for kind of a hybridized scheme between quantum sensing, quantum computation, and quantum computa computations. So um, today, I'll talk about the um, application to quantum chemistry. So uh, in the quantum chemistry, it is very important to know an energy gap between a ground state and excited state. Oh, by the way, do you see my laser point? Yes, yes. Okay, perfect, yeah. So very important to know the energy gap between the excited state and ground state or the Hamiltonian. So this kind of the information is very, very useful for the development of the new medicines. So this kind of the estimation of the energy gap between a ground state and excited state has been theoretically studied. So by using a fault tolerant quantum computer or by using NISC, com NISC computing, we can estimate such an energy gap. Also, by using a quantum annealing, we can estimate such an energy gap. Today, I'll focus about the quantum annealing. So let me um, have a quick review about what is a quantum annealing. So quantum annealing uses time-dependent Hamiltonian like this. So there are two parts of the Hamiltonian, like driving Hamiltonian and program Hamiltonians. So driving Hamiltonian typically chosen as a transverse magnetic fields. So this driving Hamiltonian is simple. So we can diagonalize this Hamiltonian and we can get an eigen value and eigen state very easily. On the other hand, we have the second term of the Hamiltonian, which we call target problem Hamiltonian. So this target problem Hamiltonian is typically very complicated. Like we cannot diagonalize this Hamiltonian, we don't know eigen state, we don't know um, eigen energy neither. So AT is an external control parameter. So AT is initially one. So we have just a driving Hamiltonian, but AT gradually decreases up to zero. So finally we have only HP. So intermediate step, we have a both driving Hamiltonian and target program Hamiltonian. So um, what's, uh, how useful is this Hamiltonian is? So by using this Hamiltonian, uh, we can prepare ground state of the target program Hamiltonian. That's a propo proposed by uh, Kado Professor Kadoaki and Professor Nishimori. So initially, we prepare the ground state of the driving Hamiltonian. 
and will、um, change the Hamiltonian gradually and adiabatically. In this case, as long as adiabatic condition is satisfied, then we can prepare the ground state of the target Hamiltonian. Once the ground state of the target Hamiltonian is prepared, we can measure the energy. So, this is how we can measure the ground state energy. So, similarly, we can、uh, measure the excited state energy as well. So, firstly, we prepare the excited state of the driving Hamiltonian, and we change the、uh, Hamiltonian gradually, adiabatically, so that as long as adiabatic condition is satisfied, then we can prepare the excited state of the target Hamiltonian, so that we can measure the excited state energy.、Um, however, the conventional approach has a kind of drawbacks if non adiabatic transition occurs. Of course, if the dynamics is slow enough, Due to adiabatic evolution, we can get to the, say, excited state or ground state. However, if the dynamics is not slow enough, then non adiabatic transitions could occur. This kind of the non adiabatic transition、um, could cause a population to, say, ground state or second excited state or third excited state or whatever. And this kind of the non adiabatic transition gives a huge error for the estimation of the energy gap. So, we alternatively we propose a robust way to estimate the energy gap between a ground state and the excited state of the target problem Hamiltonian. So, our scheme is robust against non adiabatic transitions. So, our scheme uses this modified time dependent Hamiltonian. So, I'll explain the meaning of this Hamiltonian in the next slide. Here, I'll explain the summary of my scheme. So, firstly, we prepare state superposition between the Ground state of the driving Hamiltonian and first excited state of the driving Hamiltonian. So, this superposition state、uh, has a evol time evolution、um, according to this Hamiltonian. Finally, we will measure this state by using a projection operator. So, this projection operator is a projection to the initial state. So, let me explain the meaning of this Hamiltonian. So, this Hamiltonian, this time dependent Hamiltonian, has three steps. So, first step is a quantum annealing process. Second term is Uh, very similar to a scheme called Ramsey type interference, which is used in a quantum sensing society. Finally, we will do the kind of reverse or inverse of the quantum annealing. So, as I said before, the first initial state is a superposition between the ground state and the first excited state of the driving Hamiltonian. After the quantum annealing, we will get the、uh, excited state and the ground state of the target problem Hamiltonian. Also, during the quantum annealing process, we have a kind of the relative phase here. So, after the Ramsey type process, so we will have a delta E tau. Tau is the time for the、uh, Ramsey process. And delta E is the target energy gap, energy difference between the ground state and the first excited state of the problem Hamiltonian. So, this information is very important, and this is what I want to know. So, after the inverse quantum annealing, And、um, we have a superposition between the driving Hamiltonian ground state and driving Hamiltonian excited state. So, again, we have a, a relative phase,、uh, and this relative phase has the information of the target energy gap. Finally, we perform the projection、uh, into the initial state. So,、uh, we can calculate this projection probability very easily in the ideal condition. So, it has a kind of cosine oscillation with a frequency of the delta E.、Um, however, In the real experiment, there must be some non adiabatic transitions. In that case, the form of p tau must be much more complicated. However, still, we believe that complicated form has a, should have a frequency of the delta E. So, to extract the information of the delta E, we will perform the Fourier transform. So, in the real experiment, we can change tau, and by sweeping tau, we will get many、uh, information of the p tau, like p tau n. And, From this、uh, bunch of the p tau n, by performing the Fourier transform, hopefully we can get the information of the delta E. So, in order to check the performance of our, in order to check the performance of our scheme, I perform the numerical simulation. As a driving Hamiltonian, I chose the、um, transverse, transverse magnetic field term. As a target problem Hamiltonian, I chose XXG model. We have a GG interaction and flip flop interaction. And this is a Fourier, Fourier form. So these are the parameters. And capital T is a total annealing time. So this y axis corresponds to the Fourier part, Fourier component. And x term are corresponding to the frequency omega here. So you can see from my numerical simulation, I have two peaks. So 
first peak is around omega is zero, and this peak comes from the non-aliabatic transitions. And we have a peak around omega is one gigahertz, and this corresponds to the target energy gap. So um, from numerical calculation, we have an estimation. Well, we have a peak around whose frequency is 1.0665 gigahertz. On the other hand, the true energy gap is 1.0669. So you can see these two are very, very similar. So our uh, estimation is quite accurate. On the other hand, in the conventional approach, we obtain 0.895 uh, as an estimated energy gap. On the other hand, the true energy value is like this. So oh, this uh, has a huge error bar. So this numerical simulation demonstrates that our proposed scheme is more robust against non adiabatic transitions than the conventional schemes. So I changed the parameter. So previously, I chose 150 or 30, 75 as a total annealing time. But I chose a smaller value, 37.5 or 12.5. So this means that the dynamics is faster. So we should have more non-adiabatic transitions. Due to non-adiabatic transitions, from the numerical estimation, we have four peaks. Why we have four peaks? Because we have a population of the second excited states. So again, first peak comes from the non-adiabatic transitions. Second peak corresponds to the target energy gap between the ground state and the first excited state. The second energy gap corresponds to the energy gap between first and second excited states. A fourth peak corresponds to the energy gap between the ground state and second excited state. So in the experiment, if we have these four peaks, unfortunately, we cannot specify which peak is the energy gap between the ground state and first excited state. This one or this one or this one, we don't know. In that sense, my scheme becomes less useful if we have more non-adiabatic transition, such as in this parameter regimes. However, these peaks still have some information about the eigen energy of the Hamiltonian. We don't know which is which, but this uh, definitely corresponds to the energy difference between the eigen energy of the Hamiltonian. So, depending on purpose, I believe even in this parameter regime, my scheme is still useful if I, if someone just wants to know kind of eigen energy of the Hamiltonian. So this is the summary of my talk. We propose a new way to estimate the energy gap with quantum annealing. Our scheme is more robust against non-adiabatic transitions and conventional scheme. And by the way, um, three, three or a few days before we upload our manuscript, similar scheme has appeared on archive. This scheme also uses a uh, Lambda type interference to estimate the energy gap. Yeah, that's it. Um, thank you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Yuichiro Matsuzaki, for your uh, very informative uh, presentation. While we wait uh, for the audience to write their questions in the Q&A box, you, uh, please check the Q&A box with me, though there's no question uh, at this moment yet. So same question to you as uh, Dr. Takanori. Uh, because you obtained your uh, degree from the uh, University of Oxford, uh, is there any uh, international collaboration with them or with other entities going on for your research? Uh, yeah, I'd be very, very happy to have a collaboration. Yeah, of course. Um, so from my experiments, if I talk with more researchers, I get uh -huh. more innovative idea so yeah i'd be very happy to collaborate with you. yeah any international people yeah of course okay okay because the problem with the uh you know online seminar is that we, we cannot have a networking uh, among researchers so it's uh, like a demerit for our online uh, seminars but uh i always welcome uh you know audience to contact the researchers for any possible international collaboration from singapore or uh any any country in the world, yeah. Any questions for Dr. Yuichiro for his very informative uh, presentation? At this moment, I see none. But um, okay, uh, in that case, uh, if uh, anyone come up with any questions for Dr. Uh, okay, I have one question uh, from SN. Uh, your application is mainly target, targeted for medicine. That's a question from SN. Yeah, uh, I think so. Uh, of course, estimating the energy gap between the ground state and the first excited state may have some application in other areas. 
But as long as I know kind of medicine or quantum chemistry, this kind of uh, society has a huge need to know the uh, energy gap. So yeah, I think mm -hmm. my scheme is especially useful for medicines areas. But yeah, I believe it should have another ab application as well, but it may be less practical. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. And uh, there's a second question from an uh, anon anonymous person. Uh, she says, thanks a lot for the nice introduction on uh, annealing method to estimate energy gap. I'm curious to understand a bit more about your method to map, for example, a molecule to the Hamiltonian uh, solvable on an annealing device. Thank you. Ah, I see. Thank you for a good question. So as you know, in the quantum chemistry, the Hamiltonian is written in second quantized form, like A, A dagger, or a kind of fermion or representation. So it's not suitable for uh, quantum annealing because quantum annealing is cube, it's two-level system, kind of discretized system. However, there are many unsophisticated theories to co to transform second quantized Hamiltonian into a spin Hamiltonian. I think uh, there is an open uh, program called Open Fermion, if I understand correctly. So if you download Open Fermion and if you say input the second quantized Hamiltonian, then automatically uh, spin-based Hamiltonian will be uh, obtained. So yeah, uh, this is how usually we can get to the Hamiltonian, which is suitable for quantum annealing devices. I hope this answers your questions. Yeah, uh, I yeah. hope this uh, presenter, I mean, questioner will respond if it's a good enough uh, answer to a question or you want to ask uh, any additional questions. Okay, um, at this moment, I see no more additional questions, but if uh, anyone come up, comes up with the questions for Dr. Yuichiro, then you can uh, still write your questions in the Q&A box. Okay, so thank you very much, Dr. Yuichiro. Yeah, thank and you. Thank you. Okay, now uh, let us move on to Dr. Milagu. Yeah, sorry, maybe I, I don't pronounce your name right, but uh, mm -hmm. he, he's a Nyan assistant uh, professor in the School of uh, Physical and Mathematical Sciences at the Nyan Technological University in Singapore, as well as a research ass assistant professor with the Center for Quantum Technologies, CQT, of the National University of Singapore. His research interests lie in exploring the surprising connections between complexity and quantum science. He established his research group in Singapore after receiving a fellowship from the National Research Foundation in 2016. He earned his PhD in the field of quantum computing from the University of, the, of Queensland, Queensland in 2009. His talk title for today is Interfacing Adaptive Learning with Quantum Science, Sensing and Beyond. Dr. Miller, please go ahead. Great, thank you very much. So my camera's working, you guys can see me? Yes, yes. Okay, excellent. So it's uh, great to be here to sort of uh, introduce to you guys some of the, my research. So I won't go too much about my background because I think it has been covered already, but suffice to say, I was here as a research fellow actually back in 2009 and I did a quick stint at Tsinghua, but uh, I really missed Singapore. So in 2016, I came back. And uh, since then, we've been really interested in this group, uh, this sort of uh, interface between what's called quantum technologies and sort of complexity science, and sort of, uh, which deals with big networks, big data, and how to un understand the underlying patterns between this data. And so far, we kind of run this uh, initiative we call the Quantum and Complexity Initiative here at uh, uh, mainly at Nyan Technological University, but also affiliated with the Center for Quantum Technologies at the US. And so far we have about nine research fellows from both sort of the quantum background and the complexity in the data science background. So it's a very nice interdisciplinary group to sort of uh, lead and work with. And we have about seven PhD students so far. So this was really the last picture before the circuit breaker happened. So we haven't had everyone gathered in one room for about six months now, but uh, we're looking forward to being able to do that again soon. So in terms of the themes for, um, uh, for our research, we, uh, we are looking at really this interface between these two fields. And at first, these two fields do sound quite different because when we think about complex systems, we think about very large macroscopic systems, uh, say financial networks, and it doesn't seem like it has very 
much to do with quantum systems, which look at things on the level of individual atoms. And so it turns out, though, these two fields actually do have quite a bit in common. And so a lot of what we're currently looking at is these commonalities. And some of the questions that we're looking for is things like, okay, well, with all the methods that we now use to understand big data and complex systems, with these automated learning techniques, well, can we do better quantum mechanically? And in particular, one area that we're really focusing on is this idea, okay, what happens when we start thinking about taking these techniques to the quantum regime and one of those things, of course, when we try to understand these complex systems is through learning. And we have a very complex system, we want to learn about it. And so how do we learn about these things? And one of the ways that we think about learning these things is through these ideas of agents. And I think this is a technique that is particularly nice because this is really, um, this approach is how we typically learn in sort of real life. And what I mean by that is how biological organisms typically learn. So we have a young daughter here. This is actually my daughter here in this photograph. And I mean, watching them grow up, and you can see that the way that children learn is that they experiment with their environment. There's some complex environment out there. They start off knowing very little about that environment and they probe it. So they try to kick it, they try to do something, they get some stimuli, uh, they kick a chair, it falls on their feet, they know not to do that again, that sort of thing. And uh, so the idea is that they, they take these output actions, that action interacts with the environment that they're trying to understand. There's some input stimuli and the learning agent sort of takes that stimuli, processes it, uh, stores the relevant information in its memory so that it knows uh, it knows the effects of some of these actions and then kind of learns what it should try. Uh, what happens and then perhaps try something else or at least knows how to avoid certain outcomes. And this is a very generic way of understanding sort of almost any automated learning process that kind of exists in nature. And, that's, uh, and it's also one that we can really think about from a computational or a physical perspective. Uh, it's, uh, you can really think about it in sort of this picture. Now we've just broken down that agent into two little pieces. So we still have the action coming in and we still have the input stimuli, but we can think about uh, one of these agents that are learning as, uh, uh, as composed of two components. The first component, which here I call the interpreter or the analyzer, is something that takes in the input stimuli and processes it in some way to get some useful data. This data then is, up, uh, is sent to kind of the decision-making device or the policy maker so that the decision maker has a bit more information, uh, updates some of its weights or updates some of other aspects of internal memory so that it fixes decisions for future output actions. And then this sort of closed loop process repeats. And indeed, I think computer science has taken a lot of inspiration from this picture and a lot of sort of uh, the most popular methods of reinforcement learning and et cetera, all based on variations of this model. We're saying reinforcement learning, this interpreter would give us some sort of reward. It would be, so is this a good outcome? Is this a bad outcome? That gets fed in. This could be a neural network, for example, and its weights get adjusted. But in you know, a more general picture, you can think about other learners grading descent um, uh, or other, other numerical methods, always roughly falling into this perspective. We take an input, we, uh, we compute something useful about it, like the gradient. We use that to update our decisions or what we do in the subsequent time steps. So this is sort of a, these ideas of thinking about uh, thinking about trying to understand the complex environment using this framework of uh, inputs and outputs. Now, so far everything I've described is kind of uh, very general and uh, it applies to uh, sort of whether or not our processor is a quantum uh, or whether it is classical. But being sort of part of this quantum complexity initiative, our key interest is to understand what happens when aspects of the learning process becomes quantum mechanical. And sort of what happens when we start thinking about, okay, in the future, what happens if we're trying to understand the quantum system? And what happens if we, the ability to process that data, we are now armed with quantum software or quantum computers rather than classical computers. And so 
Well, the first thing uh, that uh, that's interesting that I want to discuss, and I guess that's going to be the main topic of this, is what happens when we take our environment and it's no longer a classical environment that we uh, that we want to understand, but a quantum mechanical environment. And this is where we end up with one a natural perspective, and that I want to study outline the case study, and it's the perspective of sensing. So sensing is very much about trying to understand the properties of some external environment. And roughly speaking, you can think about sensing in this framework. There's something out there, some environment that we don't quite understand. And in the simplest scenario of that sensing, it's a, it's a single parameter sensing. So for example, we have some sort of gas or some sort of a magnetic field, and we're trying to find out, say, the density of this gas or the strength of this magnetic field. So we want to sense some parameter and we want to sense it as accurately as possible. So we want to minimize our standard error of our guess of what it's going to be. And the way that, uh, that we typically sense something is we've got to probe it with something. So we send out a probe. So for example, if it's an external magnetic field, we might choose to send out a spin and then the spin will interact with that magnetic field and that will sort of change the state of that spin system. So once it comes out on the other side, we can make some sort of measurement on it and from that get some information about the parameter we want to sense. Now, the very interesting thing is that uh, uh, recently there has been a lot of work in the area of quantum sensing and people found that when they try to sense stuff and they use the unique properties of quantum systems, they can get better scaling than their classical counterparts. And the uh, way of illustrating that is here. So imagine that we have this environment out there that we want to sense, and every time we hit it, we end up with, because of noise, we end up with some sort of standard error. So we end up with sort of some, uh, uh, we end up with some sort of variation in sort of, uh, you know, estimates. Now, the typical way that well, that we can suppress this error is to repeat this many, many times. And as long as our errors are fairly independent, then what we end up with uh, is a central limit theorem that says, okay, if we repeat this procedure n times with sort of n different probes, and then, we me uh, and then each time we, um, we measure it, and then we take a classical computer, we post-process it by just taking the average of the estimates, then our error is going to be reduced by a factor that scales with the square root of the number of trials. So the more we try this, the better estimate we get. Uh, the key thing that I want to highlight here is that there is a sc the scaling factor here is a square root. The interesting property is that if we went to fully quantum systems, we can send in a complex entangled probe. So in quantum mechanics, as we know, we can create correlations between particles that we cannot possibly create in sort of using any classical information processing. And if we had a sufficiently powerful quantum processor, we can engineer sort of tailored entangled probes for whatever properties that we want to sense. So that once these probes go through, we end up with a massively entangled state here that imprints the properties of these systems. And then if we're able to process this information um, uh, in sort of a particular manner using a quantum computer, which typically means taking all of these output states, interacting them through a series of gates on a quantum computer and then making a suitable measurement, then people have proven that in principle we can achieve a quadratic improvement in scaling. So instead of sort of reducing an error sort of uh, as a scaling of one over the square root of n, our error can suppress by one over root of n. And you can see that if we, if we had a large number of probes, this advantage is only going to grow. So if we say repeat this a hundred times, our error suppression might be a factor of 10 if we used standard non-entangled probes, but, uh, but it'd be a factor of a hundred if we use sort of this sort of quantum technique. So, uh, so there's a lot of uh, interesting prospects of this as we scale our quantum technology. But this is uh, not easy. And uh, there are a lot of, uh, and there are quite a few reasons why this isn't easy. Uh, and I think one of our first speaker, Taka Nori, has already sort of gave some very good insights on why this isn't easy. Because to do this, we need to prepare the suitable quantum probe. And to do that, that typically means that we need to take uh, these input state, uh, our input spins, and we have to interact them in some way. So we could, for example, prepare such a state using a quantum computer. But uh, as we know, 
currently our quantum devices, they, we don't have universal fault tolerant quantum computers. And so we have a limited number, uh, we have a limited amount of time where our quantum system can stay coherent. And every time we apply a gate, we don't exactly apply the gate we want to apply. Every single quantum gate that we apply or every pulse that we send to these, uh, to these probes to sort of set engineer them in the right state is going to induce, induce some error. So a big question is, given that we have these limited processes, how can we prepare the right sort of probes that can give us advantage, can give us a scaling that we're interested in, or at least uh, beat the classical bounds? And, uh, and uh, using the limited amount of resources and the limited amount of, uh, and the error tolerances and the uh, uh, sort of realistic error corrections that we have today. Now, this turns out to be a very tricky optimization problem. And so one can think about, well, can we sort of improve this using our standard learning techniques? So, uh, so if you take any sort of machine learning sort of toolbox, uh, then there are a lot of sort of optimization techniques that you can use, starting from the very basics like gradient descent to more sophisticated algorithms, say need and need algorithms, or sort of neural networks to sort of help us sort of learn. And in particular, these ad uh, agent-inspired adaptive reinforcement learning programs. So one might ask, okay, can we sort of say, let's, uh, let's cast it in sort of this agent-inspired learning framework. Can we think about, okay, we have this object, uh, our agent, he's trying to learn about this parameter in the environment. So every time he chooses an action, which is say a sequence of gates or a sequence of pulses to prepare that right quantum state, that quantum state goes, uh, feeds him through the environment, uh, comes, uh, uh, comes back, the, uh, the agent takes a look at this and goes, okay, this probe wasn't so good, so let's, uh, let's adjust things, let's, uh, let's use some sort of reinforcement technique to see if we can sort of come up with a better sequence of actions and redo this process. And we can think about this totally from the classical perspective. But the catch here is that the environment is actually very complex. It's a, it's a quantum mechanical environment. And when we do this purely classically, we end up with a few issues. Namely speaking, the first is that when we get this probe, it's not easy to know how we should post-process it to find out that parameter theta, because to actually get that advantage in quantum sensing, we need additional quantum information processing here. And what that's supposed to do is that's supposed to find the best possible way of measuring these output probes to be able to, uh, to find out uh, the most information about theta. So if we don't know the best measurement, then we don't know whether our initial probe is good or not. But to find out what that best measurement is, we really need to know what the state of the system is at this point in time. And to do that, we need to know precisely what the state of the system is at this point in time. But that is very tricky because if we try to simulate everything on a classical computer, uh, each one of these probes, each one of them, say if, if each of these probes is a single spin, a two-level system, then when we have n of these spins, and when we try to describe that into a classical computer, it's actually described by a two to the power of n vector. So the size of this vector grows exponentially with the number of probes that we want. And if we want to characterize these operations and their joint operation, that unitary is gonna be described by two to the n, by two to the n matrix. So that's gonna take an exponential amount of memory to describe. And so, uh, uh, so when we try to sort of do this optimization on a classical computer, that cost is gonna scale exponentially. And uh, it's probably going to be, uh, it's going to sort of counteract any of the sensing advantage we're going to have just from trying to optimize this process. And so this is where, uh, where we can think about some sort of hybrid learning scheme. So here what we have is, uh, well, we've established the issue is that when we have this environment that is quantum mechanical, uh, then knowing whether this probe is good requires sort of an exponential time of using a classical interpreter. So can we sort of, uh, can we sort of save some memory on this? And this is where sort of the quantum software and the quantum algorithm side comes in. Now, I won't go through the details here, but there's one algorithm that I think is really cool to know, and it, it's in a lot of, uh, it's in a lot of quantum uh, uh, protocols. So I thought I'd briefly outline it, and it's what's called the swap test. And what it is, is that if we can encode a two to the n dimensional vector, you know, sort of n qubits here, and another two to the n dimensional vector 
in n qubits here. So these are complex vectors of two to the n dimensions. And we plug them into a fairly simple circuit here. This is uh, just your Hadamard gate. Uh, it just prepares a superposition of up and down on the top spin. The key workhorse is this control swap operation. And what that does is it swaps the states of this ensemble of spins with this ensemble of spins, uh, controlled on whether the top qubit here is pointing up or pointing down. So if this top qubit uh, cub is you know, superposition of pointing up and down, what the control swap gate does is it creates a superposition of these two, uh, uh, these two systems being either, uh, either continuing as they were or swapped in state. And in doing that, you can sort of, uh, in doing this sort of uh, control swap, the superposition of swapping two ensembles and then making an appropriate measurement on this control qubit, it turns out that you can estimate the statistical overlap between these two vectors. So you can find out how close these two vectors are to each other. And you can sort of see that in a lot of areas in machine learning, uh, what's the, something that we do care about is how close two distributions are. And that is a key thing that we get to use you know, in sort of this quantum interpreter. It looks a bit complex here, but what we can do is if we are able, uh, if we can prepare sort of, um, uh, we got some candidate control sequence that we care about. And suppose we do it twice and then we add some statistical fluctuations. So we take that sequence and then, and then suppose we're trying to measure that uh, magnetic field, but instead of uh, just, uh, just taking that in, feeding into the magnetic field and then try to measure it, we first do some pre-processes and we take that magnetic field and we just add some statistical fluctuations to it. And what this does is that it adds fluctuations to both of these output states. And then we can use this algorithm to measure the degree you know, uh, in which these probe states become uh, fluctuate. Because what, uh, what happens when we measure here, this system here, is that it's measuring the statistical overlap between this state and this state. And since both of them are fluctuating, the average overlap will be a measure of how sensitive these states are to the noise. Because if they're more sensitive, they would fluctuate more, and then this, uh, this state would pick it up. So without having to find the best possible measurement to actually infer what the actual phase is using this fairly simple circuit um, that scales only linearly with the size of these quantum systems, we're able to say, okay, is this probe actually sensitive to the parameter that we want to sense? And so that then becomes our sort of our, our interpreter that tells us whether this is a good control sequence. And so once we have that, we can feed that as a quantum interpreter, and then that still gets fed into our classical learning algorithm, which is why this is a hybrid classical quantum learner. But now the classical learner is, can efficiently understand whether or not a probe is good or not, and then use our standard optimization techniques to come up with a different control sequence. And that control sequence can get fed back in. And once we really optimize things, and we've got to sort of something that is uh, that is uh, that the quantum interpreter says is very very good, then we can then finally go to the final step of working out the measurement sequence we should use to be able to actually extract that state. And uh, and so we apply this learning process into uh, uh, a sort of a, a seven eight qubit quantum simulator, and as an illustration, and it was to try to sense the external magnetic field using a very limited quantum process. And we deliberately made it quite limited just to see how well this algorithm could work. So what we envisioned was that we we're trying to sense this magnetic field with a chain of spins. So a chain of coupled spins. And this is a very limited process in the sense that these spins are interacting all the time. So we can't even control how they interact. The spins are nearest neighbors and they're interacting with a standard, what's called a spin-spin Ising interaction. And so it's a two-body interaction that just continues continuously in time. We, we don't know its strengths. We, uh, just, uh, it's, just, uh, it's just evolving using some strength. Uh, we don't know what that strength is. And what we can do, the only thing we can do to affect the output state that we want here is by sort of uh, applying X or Z Y direction magnetic fields onto the single spin, sort of uh, hit it with uh, external pulses. And this will change the interaction somewhat, but in a non-trivial way. So to, to sort of simulate that dynamics of the spin chain would take a lot of computational power. But our goal here is to say, okay, 
we don't really know the strength of the interactions, and we don't really know the precise uh, errors in these x and y sort of uh, 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 you know how we hit these things with x and y, and we we don't really want to analyze that. We don't want to simulate that. But can we still sort of use this quantum learning algorithm to uh, blindly engineer the best probes? And then, so we had to, uh, we sort of did this on a quantum simulator for up to uh, up to a n uh, up to a seven qubit spin chain. So this required a fourteen qubit quantum simulator where you are able to sort of do the swap between two pairs of these. And then, sure enough, once we did the simulation, we uh, we can see that this is basically the number of rounds. Uh, to get to the optimal, it does take uh, uh, it does take long, progressively longer and longer number of rounds to to sort of hit uh, hit the two flat lines. So we can see that when we have one or two qubit spin chains, we can get to the opt optimal pretty quickly. But once we get to seven, it does take a little bit of time. But uh, what we end up with is that uh, the probes that we we get are al have almost reached the theoretical optimal. So hitting that quantum limit of that scaling of 1 over n, uh, uh, that 1 over n advantage. And here, for reference here, is our classical sensing limit of how well we can do classically. So this sort of gives a very nice sort of uh, proof of principle demonstration that if we were to, uh, if we had these near-term computers and we could arm them with some sort of learning algorithm, then we can sidestep a lot of the issues that we have in terms of building these probes, because if we want to build them exactly, then we would have to, you know, take, uh, as sort of Takanori mentioned, we'd have to look at each one of those individual gates, and we have to either do tomography or some other way of characterizing precisely what they are, and then we'd have to use sort of a, a, a lot of classical optimization over exponentially large vector space to find out how to prepare these states. But here, if we offload that on a quantum simulator, then things can become a lot easier. And so uh, what we end up with is a hybrid learning algorithm that allows to understand quantum environments. Now, I'm basically running out of time. So what I want to do is just mention very briefly uh, some of the, uh, uh, the future directions to research here. So far, what I mentioned is simply this part being a quantum environment. One can ask, okay, what happens if that environment is a classical environment I mean, if we want to understand a classical big data problem rather than sort of quantum sensing, is this sort of technique still useful? And our, pre uh, our preliminary indication is, yes, it is still useful. For example, we were studying these cases of trying to do stochastic predictions. So you have a big stochastic process, and these things could stay designed to describe stock markets or sort of fluctuating weather systems. And we want to make predictions. We've got information from the past, and we want to sort of generate simulations of what's going to happen in the future. So we want to generate these conditional futures based on the past we observed. And it turns out that you that there exists a quantum algorithm that we designed that can sort of create these, uh, uh, can sort of generate these future outcomes. They can do so you know, with a dimensional advantage. But the more interesting thing is that they can do so while creating a superposition of all possible futures. So here, tip, uh, here, the number of possible outcomes as you observe the future, of course, grows exponentially. So say if each time step, uh, you, have, you can observe sort of a, a, a rise of the stock market, a fall of stock market, a one or a zero, a boom or a bust, then if you observe n time steps, that would be two to the n different possibilities. And so, so this probability vector here is normally an exponentially large vector, but we can encode it in sort of this a linear number of qubits. And then once we have that, we can play the same trick as we talked about in the sensing and interfere them to understand how quickly different trajectories diverge. And this can then be a hallmark of certain things that we may want to do in terms of optimizing our stochastic models. So this is one of the areas that we're presently investigating to look at what happens when our model, we have a classical environment, but we build a quantum model of that environment. And then we still use quantum uh, interpreters and sort of a quantum stimuli. But the, the final step is to take this policy maker and this action sequence and to see whether or not they can be quantized as well. To say, explore the potential consequences of taking multiple actions in superposition so we can search different outcomes. I think Emmy is going to stop me at the moment because we're really running over time. So I'd say that 
Uh, I will stop there and to say that we have some interesting preliminary evidence about the uh, prospects of simplifying this learning process with reduced quantum resources. And the summary here is that I think there's really a lot of exciting stuff here to be learned from merging all our techniques from data science in terms of sort of re reinforcement learning, recurrent learning, closed loop learning, and seeing what happens when we add in the additional power of quantum computers. And the applications here is uh, uh, really we're just beginning to explore it. And this is really our next five year plan in terms of what lo we're looking at. And so thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Milai. I, I suppose you have a lot more to share with us, but because of the time, uh, we need to uh, come, uh, you know, uh, move on to the Q&A session. Uh, uh, let, let me invite you to check the Q&A box with me. We have a question from uh, Anil. Uh, the question is, what will be the potential use cases for the quantum predictions? Mm. So this is, a, this is a very good question. So currently we are beginning to explore the use cases. Uh, one of the big advantages of these quantum models is that we can create these, all these possibilities in quantum superposition. And that gives us a lot of new quantum mechanical tools to be able to analyze these things. So for example, one of the interesting things, uh, algorithms, subroutines in quantum is Grover search and this generalization which is called amplitude amplification. And what these things allow you to do is they allow you to find particular outcomes in a quantum, uh, in a quantum database. So if you had a superposition of all possible outcomes, what these programs allow you to do is to highlight the uh, isolate specific outcomes. And these protocols, we believe, when, uh, when we have a superposition of all futures, allows us to, to pinpoint our simulations on particular areas that we're interested in. So this has things to do with searching for the likelihoods of particular outcomes, or looking at rare event sampling, where we want to sort of, uh, where we want to sort of concentrate our simulation on particular rare events. And, uh, and these things, of course, uh, we care about if these rare events have, say, catastrophic consequences. So I'm personally a quantum, uh, uh, quantum information theorist, so I'm still learning about the, uh, the applied uh, uh, specific case studies that people are very interested in, but this is something that we're currently actively exploring. So we have collaborators in, say, the stochastic finance side that we are openly talking to, so that we can point out uh, uh, the particular cases where we really care about the sort of a, well, we know the class of problems quantum can help us solve, and there's a problem matching these to, say, the problems in real life that people really care about. And I think this is a very exciting time because we're trying to bring expertise from two totally different fields. And, uh, and uh, we're trying to sort of, we work on the host kind of workshop to get people to catch, meet and meet these things, but the COVID kind of delayed that for a little bit. But this is something that we're actively wanting to explore. Yeah, yeah, uh, we all hope that we'll be uh, through this uh, COVID-19 pandemic so that the collaboration among researchers will be enhanced as before, right? Yes. Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, I think we have to mark the end of this uh, webinar. So now I'd like to uh, give the floor to Jane from SD Innovate for her closing remarks. Uh, Jane, please. Yeah, thank you, Amy. And thank you to all our presenters for the great sharing. Um, and everyone for your ongoing questions. Um, we hope to see everyone keep the conversations uh, happening even after the session. So do feel free to keep connected with everyone. Um, the second part of this series will be happening on 13th October. So do head on to SG Innovate's website to register. And we look forward to seeing everyone at the next online event. So for now, bye everyone. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you.